We're going to test, troubleshoot, align, and modify a bit X28 transceiver. Ideally this would be done before it's all put in a case such as this one is, but we'll deal with the problems as they come. So let's take and first thing we'll do is we'll power up and see just exactly what it does so we can see maybe what we have to try to do. The first step we want to do before we do anything else is turn all the drive level pots down. This is the RF drive. This is driver bias. Make sure it's all counterclockwise. These are biases for the finals. This way we're not going to hurt anything by leaving the transceiver in transmit mode for a long period of time. So now we got that done then we can proceed with the troubleshooting steps. If you have a voltage applied for the power supply, so we'll turn it on. Okay, it's motor boating. So, what that indicates is the carrier balance is off. So we'll adjust R66 just to quiet it down. Okay, if yours doesn't do that, that's just because it it's not unbalanced a bunch. So you can always preset R66 to about midpoint and that should be a good starting point. So that's got it quiet. I don't hear any static. So let's hook a signal generator up to it and see what it does. Okay this one is tuning between 14 430 and 14385. We'll we'll correct that later on, but for now we'll just apply a signal that's somewhere in that range. I have my generator set to 144, so we should be able to tune and, and find it. Well it's there, but it's really low volume. I have minus 40 dBm in and then ought to drive it to a real loud output. So we've evidently got low receiver sensitivity. So let's just start going through a troubleshooting process. The easiest way to troubleshoot one of these is go to the website. It's on golddredgervideo.com. Actually, the, probably the easiest way to get there is go to kc0wox.com and pick up the uh, heading for BitX28 kit and it will lead you into pages that you can print out for the transmitter and receiver. It's easiest to, to, to troubleshoot it using the transmitter section first because the voltages are all bigger and it will test all the common sections like the, the BFO, the filter, the VFO, the bandpass filter, and you'll be able to see and make sure that all those are working. So it's got waveforms and amplitudes there. What it calls for is 2 kilohertz 50 millivolt signal input into the mic jack. So we'll go ahead and hook up to do that. But first thing you need to make sure, and it's headlined here in, in red, if you have R92 on the board for the Electret mic, you have to capacitively couple in the audio signal into the mic from the signal generator. If you don't, you won't get any output. I've done that many times myself and then I always catch myself usually before I spend too much time. But you can just use a 1 to 10 microfarad capacitor to couple the audio into the mic jack with. First place it calls for us to look is button hook of R77. They say put R66 fully clockwise or counterclockwise. So we'll take a look at that the scope and see what it looks like. On, in our waveform pictures here, it's calling for 100 millivolts per division with a scope. And we're 1, 2, 3, 4, about 550 millivolts or so worth of signal. Now, one thing I want to mention at this point is these are all taken with times 10 probes and even though the test points are picked with care so that the probes will cause as little problem as possible, 
you really need to use a times 10 probe if available because with a times 10 probe you're putting about 10 to 15 picofarads of capacitance into the circuit to ground where with a times 1 probe you're putting around 110 to 120 picofarads to ground. That's enough to load a lot of the signal. Okay we're up to the button hook R77 R66 pots on one end and we have one, two, three, four, five, a little over 500 millivolts of signal there. Our picture called for 450 or so, but you, on most of these, a little extra, more is not a problem normally. The only place more is a real problem is on carrier balance. If you get too much carrier out. So let's adjust the pot R66 to the other end. What we should do is get a decrease and there it goes and then it ought to increase on the other side and going the other way we have one two three four about 450 millivolts so the pot does vary things so and we're right in the area of what they are calling for in the picture this is our modulation here on top our two kilohertz modulation and all the fuzz you see is the is the uh, BFO frequency the 11 megahertz we can probably stretch that out and sync on it here and you see that we have it's a little more than one a little less than one division each division is 100 nanoseconds so if there's one division at 100 nanoseconds it would be a frequency of 10 megahertz so that that's our our BFO frequency there we can come back and we see there are our modulation, 2 kilohertz modulation writing on top of the BFO so that's good, let's go to the next step the next step tells us to go to the button hook of D13 with R66 at one end. So we'll go ahead and connect to that and then take a look see what it we show. Okay, we're at the button hook of D13. We have 500, 1,000, 1,500, 1,500, 1,700 millivolts. And the procedure shows a little less than 1500 or so, so we're not going to worry about that. What we're seeing here is three frequencies. We have the upper side band, lower side band, and the carrier all there. So we have enough voltage there. Next step says to take and adjust R66 for a balance. And what we're going to see in a balance is just a minimum voltage here. So we'll adjust and What's happening is the carrier is being removed, and right somewhere at that point is a balance point. And if we go the other side, that's the other side all the way. So let's just take it down to a balance point here. It's about there, and let's measure the voltage there. And we have about 200, 400, almost 600 millivolts. And the procedure calls for about 300 there, so actually we're in good shape. We have more output out. For some reason, this one's a little hotter than the normal ones I've had, but uh, I'm sure we can live with that. Now, you've seen some real strange pictures on the oscilloscope. Let's take a look at the spectrum analyzer because it'll actually show you what's going on at that point. Okay, we have R66 adjusted all the way to one end. Here's our carrier, here's our lower side band, and here's our upper side band. Our balance modulator should remove the carrier. So what we're going to do is we're going to adjust R66 slowly and then we're going to go through one end all the way to the other. As we adjust it, we see the carrier starting to decrease. It's getting smaller. That's what it's supposed to do. Now it's getting larger. So what we did is we went through the balance point. This is R66 on the other side. So what we'd want to look for is adjust it for a minimum point. 
So we'll adjust the carrier there. We don't have to worry about getting it real close here. We just want to try to get it down to where it'll reduce maybe 20 or so dB. And you could also adjust the capacitor here. Because it'll affect it. So I'm adjusting the capacitor. So we'll adjust it for a null here. And not really worry a whole lot about it because it'll be a whole lot easier a little later on. Also, we're probably affecting the circuit a little bit with our scope probe where it sits. So we have 20 dB of carrier suppression there anyway. So what we're going to do is the next step that goes into the filter. And coming out of the other side of the filter it ought to get rid of the carrier here and it ought to get rid of the lower side band because the filter band pass is going to be adjusted with the uh, BFO so that this will be inside the carrier band pass and the other two won't be. The next step is to go to the button hook at D11. It's the outgoing side of the crystal filter so at this point we should only see the upper side band. The lower side band and what was remaining of the carrier ought to be gone because the filter is going to suppress that. So let's go look at the button hook of D11. We're at the button hook of D11 and we have one, two, three, about 350 millivolts or so of signal there and it's a nice clean sine wave and it's at our 11 megahertz IF frequency and the procedure called for 300 or so, so we're good there. If we were to go back and adjust R66 to get put carrier back in there, see what you start seeing is a bunch of fuzz and stuff. So you can actually adjust R66 a little bit this way just for a clean looking sine wave coming through the filter. Now let's try one other thing while we're at this point is let's adjust the BFO frequency. The BFO frequency has to be proper so that it mixes with the audio frequency and ends up with the upper sideband inside the filter's band pass. So if I adjust the BFO frequency, see I can adjust it so I have less or more and here I have the probably have the upper side band adjusted into the middle of the bandpass filter here it's adjusted down one side a little bit let's take a look at the BFO frequency just to see what it actually is sitting at Okay, we're reading 10.9937 on the low end, and we'll adjust that just to see where that goes. We're around 10.995, so it's only getting about 2K of adjustment. I think we're a little low on this, so what I normally do is I don't use C88 in the BFO section so we'll take that out later on after we get to where we can get underneath the board and we'll measure the range then because I think we need to be maybe about half a K or so higher than what we're able to reach with C88 in place so we'll go on to the next step the next step calls for the junction R14 and L10. This is after we go through the mixer, so this should be up at 14 megahertz now, and it's calling for about 200 millivolts of signal. So we'll take a look at that. Okay, we're at the junction of R14 and L10. The procedure calls for a couple hundred millivolts of signal, and we have a couple hundred millivolts of signal here. so. It also says it ought to, frequency ought to vary by adjusting the, the tuning capacitor. And we can see it changing things a little bit. Uh, it's pretty hard to tell watching the frequency here because there's still some other noise and mixture and 
harmonics still in the signal. So those will go away a little later. So let's take a look at the spectrum analyzer and see what the signal looks like on it. The spectrum analyzer is showing us the carrier here, the upper sideband here, and the lower sideband here. So what we're seeing here is 10 dB per division. We see there's 10 dB suppression, 20 dB, almost 30 dB of carrier suppression. And by playing with the adjustments, we could improve that if we adjust R66 we can see it change here and we'll get into adjusting that a whole lot more closely when we get done with the PA biases. One thing we didn't do is try adjusting the VFO frequency. If we adjust that we see things move. If we adjust the fine tune, we see things move. So everything's working fine. What we're seeing down here is the second harmonic of the modulation frequency, but it's way down, so that's not a problem at all. I've had to backtrack a little bit in the process of getting ready to take the final test, my signal went away. I experienced this problem one other time with this receiver. So there's evidently a poor solder joint or an intermittent connection somewhere. So I've backtracked back to the button hook of D11. I still have the signal there. So we're good there. So the next step was to go to R14L10 and that's after the output of the mixer. Right now we're at the output of the crystal filter. From here, this signal which is our 11 megahertz goes in and mixes with the VFO and comes out the other side of the mixer at our 14 megahertz. I'm back at R14L10 and I could tap and make things go away in that area. So I, they seem to be coming and going in there. So I think the easiest way to fix this point is to pull the board and resolder all the connections in that area and see if that makes the problem go away. So I'm going to work on doing that next. Now we have the board removed from the case and hooked up with all the external connections so that it's fully functional here. In fact, I ran mine and had many, several QSOs with it sitting in just such a condition but what this does is it allows us to have full access to the top and the bottom of the board easily and if we want to rotate it we can just disconnect things here real quickly and then plug them back on so that we can work with the bottom of the board and the top of the board and do it with ease. I left my old home country. My mother and dad said, son, don't go wrong. Remember that God will always watch over you, and he will be waiting for you here at home. Son, don't go Now they're 